Good to see you all here this morning. Everybody's summer going okay? Yeah? Two people are having a good summer? All right. Woo! Hey, so next Sunday, come and we're going to, uh, we're going to hear about camp and Pastor Eric's going to share a little bit about uh, what it is that these uh, young people have really gained and we're going to hear some testimonies and it's going to be an awesome time to reflect on what God is doing through this next generation. Does anyone believe that the next generation God is going to use for his kingdom and for his glory? Does anyone believe that? All right, me too. So, hey, we're going to do that. And then the week after that, we're going to start a new sermon series called Chain Reaction. And we're going to be looking at uh, the impact of our decisions and how we can impact other people's lives. And how what you'll find is that your decisions will, will impact way farther than what it is that you know. It's like a ripple. When you throw that, that rock into a lake and the ripple begins to go, uh, there is a ripple effect in our lives when we make decisions and when we connect with people that... Uh, go far beyond what you ever know. We have Summerfest coming up, our outreach, summer outreach, and the impact that that has, you may not see it immediately, but it does have impact, and there's a chain reaction that takes place. So that's going to be it. But first, let's get into this message today. We're, we're concluding a sermon series called United We Stand uh, as we talk about unity and how important that is to build in our lives uh, because we've been, we've been dealing with uh, this idea this year. Our theme for this year as a church is to be connected. And if we're going to be connected, we've got to understand unity and the power of unity in our lives. And I want to just read you a quick story uh, that happened in a church way back. So a Sunday school teacher had just concluded her lesson and wanted to make sure she had made her point. She said, can anyone tell me what you must do before you can obtain forgiveness of sin? There was a short pause, silence, and then from the back, a little boy spoke up and said, sin? Okay, he's not wrong. He had it right. How do you obtain forgiveness for sin? What do you have to do first? Well, you have to sin. Now, that's the easy one. Now, how do you obtain forgiveness? How do you receive forgiveness? How do you walk out forgiveness? That's what we're going to talk about this morning is the power of forgiveness in our life. So before you get up and walk out and say, I ain't got nobody to forgive in my life, uh, let's, just, let's just hang on for a second and let's look at what forgiveness is all about. Because if we're honest, forgiveness can be hard. Have you discovered that forgiveness is hard? Have you found that, that when you think about forgiving someone, that some of the first thoughts that come to your mind are, they don't deserve it. They don't deserve to be forgiven. Or, or I can't let them off the hook. Or maybe we think, well, I'm still hurt. They hurt me. They don't deserve to be forgiven. And what happens is we too often place greater weight on being right than being in right relationship. And we want to look at what the Bible says about forgiveness and that forgiveness is a must. And we're going to look at how to walk that out. It's not easy, but it's possible, and it is essential. If you want to take notes with us, with us this morning, uh, please do take notes. If you don't, didn't bring pen and paper, you can use the YouVersion Bible app uh, and go to the Events tab and take notes, or you can download Abundant Life Ordine, our church app. And if you hit more, there's a sermon notes section in there. And I think on that app, there's even a couple fill-in-the-blanks to help us keep our attention onto the message so we can figure out what to write down there. So I want to talk to you about about forgiveness and the importance of it. Now, there's this guy in Scripture in, in the New Testament, and I just like to call him that guy. You know that guy who has a bad reputation? Is there anyone you know that just has a bad reputation? There's this guy in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and honestly, the guy's a total creep. And, and I, I, when I think about this guy, I just think, oh, that guy. And he's the guy that, that Paul wrote about and was pretty upset with. And, uh, and this guy, he was really... Uh, bringing some really gross sexual immorality into the church. It was like a spiritual cancer that he was being brought into the church. And I won't go into all the details of that. You can read about it if you'd like in 1 Corinthians 5. But Paul says about this guy, he says, You must throw this man out and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed and he himself will be saved on the day the Lord returns. That is like a big deal, right? I've I've never thought, like, this must have been really bad. Because as a pastor, like, there, we all have sin in our life. I've never thought, like, yeah, just, just throw that guy out and let Satan have him. Like, that's a pretty, like, Paul's a pastor, and he loved people, and he wanted these people come to Jesus. So this must have been a pretty big deal, that this guy was really destroying the church, destroying unity in the church, destroying holiness in the church, and he needed to be dealt with. And, and so we, we've got to be clear, this guy really did need to be removed and, and that's not something that, that anyone would ever take lightly. And so 
he had to be taken out of the assembly because he was destroying the assembly. Isn't that, hard? Isn't that painful stuff that we deal with in our lives is when there's that, there's that thing that is causing all that strife and that, that problem and you've got to remove it and it's, it's very difficult to remove. But, but here's the afterthought about this. What do you do when this guy repents? Because I, I, don't, Paul didn't, I don't think Paul, knowing the character of Paul and his desire to, be people, to see people saved by Jesus, his desire wasn't just to say, get rid of this guy and let him rot. His hope was that this guy was going to go out and, and, and his lifestyle and the, the things that he had brought into his life were going to bring him to such a rock bottom that he was going to turn back to Jesus. So what do you do when this guy turns back to Jesus? What do you do when he repents? What do you do when he sees the error of his ways? And he comes back to the church and he says, I messed up. I, I, I made too many mistakes. What is our response to those kinds of things? What is our response? Do we say, oh, no, no, you caused too much hurt. You can't. You can't. Do we say, well, we can't possibly forgive him. You know, he, he really hurt me. What do we do about this? Well, Paul tells the church what to do now in 2 Corinthians, verse 5. We'll read this together. It'll be up on the screen for you. He says, I'm not overstating it when I say that the man who caused all the trouble hurt all of you more than he hurt me. Most of you opposed him, and that was punishment enough. Now, however, it is time to forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overcome by discouragement. So I urge you now to reaffirm your love for him. I wrote to you as I did to test and see if you would fully comply with my instructions. When you forgive this man, I forgive him too. And when I forgive whatever, and when I forgive whatever needs to be forgiven, I do so with Christ's authority for your benefit, so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. So Paul says, this guy's coming back, and you've got to forgive him. You've got to come to this place and, and forgive him, and, and know that when you forgive him, I forgive him too. And when we all forgive him, you've you got to remember that Christ forgives him too, when he comes back and repents. But this last verse really is what struck me the most in this whole little section of scripture. It says, so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. Interesting statement when it comes to a man who had created, uh, created havoc in the church. He says, forgive so that Satan will not outsmart us. Did you know that offense is a scheme of the enemy? Offense is a scheme of the enemy, and it not only destroys unity, it destroys the person who is offended. It destroys the person who is carrying that offense. And you might be dealing with something this morning. You came in here this morning and say, I don't want to deal with this offense. I don't want to deal with forgiveness this morning. But here's what I want you to know as we get into this message this morning. Refusing to forgive is to be outsmarted by Satan. And I, I don't know anyone who would say, oh, I, I'm, as I'm in Jesus Christ. I want to be outsmarted by Satan. That is my goal. That is none of our goals. We, we don't want to be outsmarted by Satan, but the Word of God says that when we carry this offense and we don't walk in forgiveness, we are actually being outsmarted by Satan. And you know what? When I, and, and I might not have motivation to forgive someone, but I'll tell you what, I will not be outsmarted by Satan. <laughs> I will not let his schemes work in my life because I have been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. And I am his, and I will walk in freedom. You see, when we walk in unforgiveness, you're the one who suffers. You are the one who suffers. Proverbs 18, 19 tells us this. It says, an offended brother is harder to reach than a fortified city, and quarrels are like the bars of a fortress. See, when you determine to stay offended, you're the one behind bars. When you determine, I will not let this go, you, I cannot forgive this person. I don't care what they've done to me. I know they've come back and they've said that they're sorry, but I don't believe it. Because if they were really sorry and if they really meant it, they wouldn't have said it in the first place. Come on, anyone said anything that you wish you could take back? Right? Anyone say something that wasn't true, but there might have been a little truth mixed in with it? Right? But you're saying, man, I take that back. I didn't mean it. Now, that, maybe you meant it in that moment. Maybe when things got really tough, when someone backs you into that corner, when someone backs you and you become like a honey badger, right? And you're all nice and everything, but you get backed into that corner and then they say that one thing that they know. You have someone in your life that they know which button to press. I mean, they know that. And next thing, the badger comes out. 
right? And it just comes, and all of a sudden, all this stuff starts flying out of your mouth, and you just, you say it, and then you wish you could take it back. We all have these things. And you may not want to deal with the things that have been said to you, but here's the thing. When you determine to stay offended, you're the one behind bars. And the only way out is forgiveness. Because when you choose forgiveness, you are the one that's set free. See, we get so concerned with like, I've got to hold power over this person. And if I forgive them, then they're going to be free of it. No, when you forgive them, you become free. They've got to still deal with the Lord on this thing. And maybe they have. But, but you have got to set yourselves free. Has anyone ever played Monopoly before? You played Monopoly? No one like, you don't like Monopoly? It takes a long time. Risk takes longer, by the way. <laughs> Not if you know what you're doing. Oh, is that a challenge? <laughs> All right. Risk battle. Uh, it's a long game. It's a really long game. And you know the worst place to land in risk? Jail. Jail. Well, the worst place to land is Park Place with a bunch of hotels on it. But that's not, all right? Boardwalk. Jail. I hated at the beginning of the game when you land in jail because you're just trying to get going and you get stuck in jail and you, you've got like, how do you get out of there? My, one of my favorite cards, like hold on to that get out of jail free card. In fact, hold on to two of them, hold on to three of them, sell them for a thousand bucks because they're worth a lot. Maybe not a thousand bucks. See, without the get out of jail free card, you have options. What are your options if you, if you don't have a card? Roll double. Roll double or, pay. or pay, which is kind of sketchy. Like in real life, like can you pay? Like here, here's a couple hundred bucks. Let me out. Uh, I guess bail maybe. Um, you got to roll the right combination or you got to pay money. It's going to cost you something. Well, here's what you got to know about forgiveness. It's a get out of jail free card. It's a get out of jail free card. And if you don't have that card, if you don't have forgiveness, that card of forgiveness, all you can do is hopelessly roll dice in life. And you end up being the one who pays. Or you're stuck. So how do you walk out forgiveness? And that's what I want to look at this morning. And, and, and this is probably not going to be a very long message, but I hope it's going to be a practical message for you this morning. Can we turn to Colossians chapter 3, verse 12? If you would turn there with me, we're going to look at that section of text. Colossians 3, verse 12 through 15. And, and I believe that in Colossians 3, 12, that Paul gives us a roadmap to walk out forgiveness in our lives. If you've been in a place in your life where you're saying forgiveness is, is, is tough, and, and I would say when it comes to forgiveness... You know, a lot of times I think the toughest person to forgive is yourself. The toughest person to forgive is yourself for the mistakes that you've made and the, and the things, and we've got regrets in our lives. And some of you are walking in here today, and you have an issue with forgiveness over yourself. You just can't forgive yourself for the things that have happened in your life. But I pray that today God would set you free. Set you free from the trap of forgiveness. That no longer would someone else be able to hold power over you. That no longer would the enemy outsmart you. But that we would be able to walk in forgiveness today. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 says, Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, so, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. I want to pray over this message so that and I just believe that God, there's going to be something in here that for some of you is going to set you free this morning. So let's, let's ask God to come and breathe life into this. Lord, we ask this morning that you would breathe life into the, in the, in the rest of this message, Lord God, that, that you would speak to us, that there are some things I believe that some people need to hear today, that you would set people free in this area of forgiveness, Lord God, that you would show us how we can walk out forgiveness in our lives in a, in a new way, in a fresh way, Lord God, the places where we've been stuck in it, the places where we felt like it's impossible or it's just too hard, I pray, Lord God, that, that this passage of Scripture this morning, that, that it would show us what it means 
to walk out forgiveness. So Lord, help us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. How do you walk out forgiveness? Well, we're going to just do verse by verse here this morning. There's four verses, and we're going to look at this roadmap. So if you want to walk out forgiveness in your life, if you want to be in a place where you are free, if you want to figure out how to deal with this thing, the first thing you've got to do is wear the right clothes. You've got to wear the right clothes. It says to clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Wear the right clothes. Have you ever worn the wrong clothes to an event? Is that like your worst nightmare? Like someone invites you to something and you're like, what is it? Is it formal? Is it semi-formal? You, in, you know, it's, it's bad like when you underdress to an event, but it's worse to wear a tux when everyone else is wearing shorts. Then you really look out of place, right? Wearing the wrong clothes to an event, like sometimes that stresses me out when I go to these things. And then it's like, if I've never been to this place, uh, it's like, what do I wear? I've worn to the wrong clothes to an event before. Now, I, I definitely have like overdressed and underdressed, but it's not that big of a deal, you know. Y- you can own it. You can just make it work and just be like, hey, this, is my, this is who I am, this is my vibe, and you can kind of play it off. But maybe. So, but I remember this time where I really wore the wrong clothes to this event, and it was a football game. And my son plays football, and, and he, uh, when he was younger, he played on a team that all the, color, all the uniforms were green. And so um, everybody wears green, and so we got our whole side of the stadium, and, and everybody wears green. And, uh, and I didn't have anything green to wear that day, and it was a cold day, and it was football season, college football season, so I, I put on my UW sweatshirt because that's what I, you know, I like to wear on Saturdays during football season because, you know, why not? Go Huskies. And Johnny's not here to tell me that I can't say go Huskies, so. <laughs> so I wore my UW sweatshirt like I did a lot of times on Saturdays, no big deal. And most parents wore green to the game, so I was kind of already the odd one out. I'm, a, I'm, I'm purple sitting there in a sea of green, and it's, you know, it's not a big deal. But that day, that day something was different. That day the opposing team's color was purple. <laughs> and there I sat, a traitor in a sea of green. <laughs> Who are you rooting for, buddy? And I'll tell you what, I would have taken off my uh, purple sweatshirt, but I had a purple Huskies t-shirt underneath, so it didn't work out. (laughs) So, you know, that was a bad tactical error on my part. I understand. But you just kind of get into, like, I wore the wrong clothes, and I just sat there going, I wore the wrong thing today. And I got asked a few times by some parents. They were were ribbing me a little bit, like, oh, really? Okay. Okay. Oh, I just didn't have green to wear. I'm sorry. And you just kind of, you know the feeling though? Or you just kind of feel like I'm an idiot. Like that's the feeling. That's how I had that day. Well, you know, you can wear the wrong clothes to the event of unity too. When When we're talking about unity, you can wear the wrong clothes when it comes to unity in our life. You can wear, you can wear offense. You can wear defensiveness. You can wear arrogance. You can wear harshness. Or it says you can clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You've got to understand something about getting dressed for unity, getting dressed for forgiveness. It's intentional. It's intentional. Getting dressed in the right clothes is a conscious decision. Did anyone make a conscious decision of what they wore today? Did you just kind of go, well, that, that looks fine? Did you make sure, like, that the pants and the, the shirt went together? Or, you know, anyone do that? Some of you do that? Fine. Did anyone do that for their kids? Are we all under, is it just summer break and no one cares? I don't know. It's a conscious decision. Wearing the right clothes to unity is a conscious decision. Well, what do I mean by that? I mean that if you want to be a person of unity in your life and you want to walk out freedom in your life, then you've got to stand in front of the closet of your heart and make a decision what am I going to wear? What am I going to wear in this situation with this person, with this relationship, with this hurt, with this wounding? What am I going to wear to this event when I think about it, when I talk about it, when I encounter this person? What am I going to wear today? What am I going to wear? Well, that look, oh, defensiveness. Yeah, that outfit will look great today. Yeah. No, I'm right. That's it. I'm going to wear I'm right today. I'm going to put right. I'm going to button that thing up. What are we going to wear? We, we put those on. It's almost like we get up and I'm right. We're like, how did this get on me already? You know, it's just there already. Defensiveness. I wear. You got to make a decision in your life to say, oh, gentleness. Yeah, I'll, I'll wear that gentleness sweatshirt today. 
I, I think I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna wear the, the humility shirt today. And, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put on my, my patience coat today. It's a conscious decision that we have to make. Are we wearing the right clothes to forgiveness? Because how do you know if you're wearing the right clothes when you think about this person or this situation or this, this wounding? When you think about it, you automatically want to go hurt someone in that moment. You automatically get defensive. You automatically get mad. Now, listen, I want you to understand something about forgiveness. When you forgive, there's a decision that needs to be made. The feelings don't always just go away right away. Did you know that you can forgive someone and still feel a little bit like you're not in love with that person? Did you know that? It's not about this feeling, but you can wear the right clothes to forgiveness. Say, okay, I'm going to choose to not be defensive when I see this person today. I am going to choose. I know when I see this person, my immediate mode is sarcasm because I don't believe a word they say because they are liar, liar, pants on fire every time I see them, and that may be true. But that one time they lied, it really messed you up. How am I going to approach that today? What clothes am I going to wear? What clothes am I going to wear? Are you wearing the right clothes to forgiveness? If you're not, I would suggest that you change your clothes before you encounter the situation again. Let's look at the next verse. Verse 13 tells us to forgive from a position of forgiveness. Forgive from a position of forgiveness. It says that make, we are to make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Anyone except for that one person, forgive anyone who offends you. We are to forgive from a position of forgiveness, not from a position of it being deserved. If you only forgive people because they deserve to be forgiven, then you will forgive almost no one. If Jesus, if through Jesus, God was to forgive people based on their deservedness of forgiveness, he would have forgiven almost no one. No one at all. Forgiveness is extended from a place of forgiveness received. We extend forgiveness because we've received forgiveness. It says in Ephesians 4.32, it says to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. Did you know that when you hold on to unforgiveness toward others, what we're truly doing is we're failing to recognize that God forgave us. When we hold on to unforgiveness toward others, we fail to recognize that God forgave others. So, so we say things like, I, I can't, I can't, I can't forgive that person. They don't deserve it. They don't deserve my grace. Well, the Bible tells us that we can't earn God's grace. And that person probably can't earn your grace either. We don't deserve forgiveness. Can you agree with that? Does anyone agree with that, that you don't deserve it? Did God, did Jesus forget? Now, hopefully in your life, that you are coming to a place in your life in Jesus, that there, is, there are more times in your life where you're not sinning than when you are. We get to that place, hopefully, where we're maturing in Christ. But did he forgive you before you were being perfected? Yes, he did. Did he find you in the pit and pull you out? Yes, he he did. You see, we don't deserve forgiveness. And the person that is holding that power over you, they may not deserve it either. But if you want to experience true freedom, you forgive anyway. Because when you, when you are struggling to forgive, I, I just honestly, does anyone ever struggle to forgive besides me? This hopefully will change your perspective this morning. When you are struggling to forgive, remember the debt that Jesus paid for you. First place to start. I just don't know if I can forgive this person. They've done too much. Stop in that moment and say, God, remind me what you forgave me for. Remember the debt that Jesus paid for you. And then walk out forgiveness from that place of being forgiven. In Matthew 18, there's a parable. Jesus told a parable in Matthew 18. And he tells about a servant, a servant who, who was in a lot of debt, big time debt, like he couldn't pay it back. And he owed his master so much money 
that it just life wasn't going to work out for this guy anymore. You can go back and read it if you want, Matthew uh, chapter 18. He owed this guy so much money that it was crippling. It, it was like he was, everything was foreclosing, he needed to file bankruptcy, all that. It was bad. And he went to his master, and he got on his knees, and he cried, and he pleaded, please forgive me. Please, you've got to forgive me. Please, I can't, I can't do this. And it says that this master forgave his da- debt. He said, okay, I got, I got enough money. I guess I don't need yours. You are forgiven. You're forgiven. And this man walked away from this interaction with his master, completely forgiven, free, Imagine that feeling. Imagine that if you were in this place, imagine walking in to the office of your mortgage company, whatever size your mortgage is, and saying, I just, I can't come up with it. Can you forgive this month's payment? And they say, we'll just forgive the whole thing. The house is yours. Would that be a good day for anyone (laughs) in this room? Just, it's yours. It's all yours. You can have it. It's forgiven. It's forgiven. Now imagine turning around. You walk in. Your mortgage is forgiven. You got that? Now a friend of yours, about six months ago, bought your lawnmower for 100 bucks. And he said, I'll pay you later. He never did. That doesn't happen, right? Usually with family. Let's change that. Your family member (laughs) bought a lawnmower for 100 bucks. And they said, I'll pay you later. You know, I'm good for it. And you know, a month after that, you kind of felt like, ah, hey, hey, uh, were you going to pay me that 100 bucks? Hey, yeah, I don't have it yet. I'll pay, I'll pay you next month. Next month came around, and now you're kind of feeling awkward. You're like, ah, they'll pay me. I feel bad. Maybe they don't have the money. And then like six months goes by, and now you're kind of like, I don't even want to ask anymore. But I want my 100 bucks. And so you walk in, you get on your knees, and you're like, please, I can't pay my mortgage anymore. I don't have the money. And they say, here you go. Here's the title. The house is yours. You're forgiven. You leave that mortgage office and you feel so good and the next day you wake up and you remember that lawnmower and you call up that family member and you say, pay me my hundred bucks or I swear I'm going to come over and get that lawnmower back myself. I want my money and I want it now. Does that seem ridiculous to anyone? Well, well, here's what it says. This servant in the Bible, he was forgiven this massive debt He had someone who served him, and that servant went to him and said, I don't have the money. Could you please forgive my debt? And that guy says, no, I'm not forgiving your debt. Pay me back. It's not that much money. Well, that guy's master finds out, and he calls him back and says, are you kidding me right now? You cannot be serious. I just forgave you this much, and you can't forgive this much? You can't forgive this much? And he says, you wicked servant. Jesus tells the story, and he follows up, and he says, when you've been forgiven this much, how could you not forgive this much? And the the, the same thing goes when we come to this place of forgiveness in our lives. We've got to forgive from forgiveness. Why does Jesus tell that story? He wants us to remember that we've been forgiven this much. And although sometimes the things that happen in our lives, it feels as though they're this much, that in the reality of things, they really are this much. Now, for some of you, they might be this much. But we've got to go back and say, Jesus, I remember that you forgave me this much. And I choose to forgive. Because when we forgive others, it is a reflection of our right relationship with God. Imagine reflecting a right relationship with God to someone else in your life. Imagine going to someone who feels they don't deserve to be forgiven and they hear from your mouth, I forgive you. It's a reflection. How can you forgive me? Because God has forgiven me much. When we forgive, it is a reflection of our right relationship with God. So if we're going to walk out forgiveness, we first got to wear the right clothes. We've got we to figure out how we're going to approach this. We've got to wear the right things. And then we forgive from a position of forgiveness, not from a position of deservedness. Number three, verse 14, tells us, 
Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony. See, like forgiveness, love is a choice, not a feeling. Love is a feeling too, right? Does anyone have a feeling when they're in love? Like, do you remember like someone who you really liked and they walked in the room and you kind of got that feeling inside of you? Anyone had that feeling before? You know what I'm talking about. No one's had that feeling? Okay. So Brian and Carrie, could you stand up for a second? They lead our marriage ministry. And if you're looking to get that feeling back, we'll have marriage classes this fall. And I'll help you rediscover that feeling. Love is a feeling, but it's more than a feeling. Have you ever loved someone but not liked them? Maybe not in that moment. Like, I don't like you right now. Like, I like you in general, but right now, you best leave my presence. <laughs> right, you ever had that one? And you know what smart men do? I'm not, oh, men, did I say men? Is they go ahead and leave the presence for a moment, right? Yes, I'm not smart, necessarily, all the time. But if you're in a relationship with anyone, maybe it's a friend, and you've really upset them, and they say, you better just step off and give me some space right now. I'll just, just, just do it for that moment. But you could still love them, and they could still love you, and you know that you're going to love each other because love is more of a choice than a feeling. And we don't have to be in love to love. We can choose love because we know that God loves even the one who wronged us. That's a tough one, right? The person who did damage to our lives, if you were to stop and say, okay, God, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you love him? God, do you love her? Have you ever... Have you ever asked God that question and he said no? When, it, when the Bible tells us when God so loved the world, there's not like a little asterisk over there, right? Except Jerry. <laughs> that guy's a jerk. <laughs> you know, it doesn't say that anywhere. The world includes every person, including the jerk. It includes every single one of us. <laughs> All right over there, Carrie. <laughs> Do you know a Jerry or something? <laughs> when he says he loved the world, that means every single person. So the person who you're thinking, man, I don't know if I can forgive them, say, God, do you love them? Ask him that question in prayer. Go to him and say, God, do you love this person? You you know what the answer is going to be. Well, sometimes you just need to hear God say it. And it begins to break the walls down. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, it says, We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. You see, when we love, we follow the commands of God. We're following his instructions. We're following his commands. And I, I get this scripture isn't nice and fluffy at all. Like, I, I don't really like, I don't like it all the time. Do you ever read parts of your Bible that you don't like? Like when it calls me a liar, I don't like that part. But it says that if we claim to love God and yet hold hate in our hearts, he says, you're lying. You're lying because if you love God, you will follow the commands of God, and the commands of God is to love. And so we love, we love, we choose love in forgiveness. We choose love. And you might not be able to choose your own love. You might not be able to choose the feeling kind of love, but you might have someone in your life where you say, okay, I choose God's love for them. I can't love them. I can't drum up the feelings of love right now because I'm really upset. And that's okay. You say, God, I'll choose your love. I know you love them, and so I'm just going to stand behind that for right now. I'm not at the place where I can love them, but God, I can stand behind the place and say, okay, God, you love them, and I'll stand next to you as you love them. Maybe that's the starting place for some of you. As you might have someone in your life and say, I could never stand next to that person and tell them I love them. Okay. And you know what? You may never, and you may never need to. But can you just say, God, hold my hand, and I'll stand there while you tell them you love them, and I can stand next to you. And watch what God will do in your life. Fourth and final thing this morning in verse 15. 
tells us, let us be let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. Put peace in charge. Put peace in charge. Let peace rule. The default setting of our hearts is what? I'm in charge. That's the default setting. My way. I'm right. That's the default setting. Now, you might say, I don't know what you're talking about. That's not me. When you leave here today, ask someone you're really close to, is this my default setting? And just be prepared for the truth. Because that is the default setting of the heart, is I'm right. The default setting of the heart is my way. The default setting of the heart is I am going to be in charge. I am in charge here. But we've got to make a decision to give up our authority and give that authority to peace. And we've got to determine in our hearts that we will let peace reign. Peace, you get to be in charge today. You get to be in charge today. Romans 14, 19 tells us, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Did you know that when it comes to peace, that effort is required? Effort is required. Now, I don't want you to get confused this morning. Because I, I feel like some of you might at this point say, I, I don't know if I can do this because I just don't want to be a pushover. Don't get peace confused with pushover. They're not the same thing. They are not the same thing at all. You see, being a pushover really is false peace. False peace is saying just whatever, I'll just, fine, just take advantage of me again or just do, do it your way and I'll just suck it up again. That's false peace. That's just placating the situation. Don't, you don't have to be a pushover to have peace. You can stand for what's right and still have peace. But it's got to be the right peace. And the right peace is peace that comes from Jesus. And only peace that comes from Jesus will bring reconciliation. The, the whole idea of peace, of, oh, let's just play nice. Can we just like pretend this didn't happen and get along today? That, that's not going to bring real peace. That's not going to bring anything lasting. It might bring peace for a moment. You've probably had situations in your life where you've had an issue that's come up and you've made a decision. Oh, can we just, can we have peace? We're on vacation this week. Can we just not talk about it and have peace? What happens after vacation when life starts back up again? Did the issue go away because you kind of faked peace for a week or you decided to get along? No, it's right back there again. So what kind of peace do you need? You need the real peace, the peace that comes from Jesus. And the peace that comes from Jesus is the peace in which you say, I ain't got none of my own, so I need yours. His peace will well up from the inside when you put it in charge. But it's a conscious decision in this moment. When you walk into a situation and you know there's strife is going to be there, you know unforgiveness is there, you've got to stop and say, okay, okay, I'm going to walk into the situation this morning, Lord. Okay, I have the right clothes on. I remember that you've forgiven me. I'm going to choose love when I interact with this person this morning. And peace you get to be in charge. I put you in charge this morning, peace. Peace of Jesus, would you come inside of me and would you be in charge today because I don't have it. With my peace, I run out of my supply really, really quick. When it's my peace, it's like I'm carrying around a bucket with holes in the bottom. And I'm like, all right, let's get some peace. And I walk around, and I'm like, it's been a minute. How am I out already? But the peace of Jesus isn't like that. It comes from the inside and it begins to well up and overflow in us. And his peace is what we need if we're going to walk out forgiveness in our lives. I want to ask you this morning. We just Can we stand? And would you just, after you stand, close your eyes. Don't do both at the same time. <clears throat> you close your eyes with me this morning. I, I want you to really seriously ask yourself this question this morning. You might have to think about it. Some of you might not need to think about it at all. Is there an area of unforgiveness in your life that is keeping you locked up? Are you being outsmarted by Satan? Are you allowing bitterness to affect every area of your life? I want to close with this scripture in Hebrews 12, 15. It says, look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Church, this morning, our prayer teams 
I want to do just that. Look after each other. Stand with you. Stand together so that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up. To stand with you. Because sometimes forgiveness is something that we feel like I just can't do. But when we have someone stand with us and say, you can say out of your mouth, I, I know I need to forgive and I want to forgive, but I just can't. We want to pray with you this morning. I want to see you set free this morning. If it's you that you need to forgive, I want to see you set free and be able to say for the first time to yourself, I forgive you. Remind yourself, God has forgiven you. Do not let offense and unforgiveness hold power over you one more day. This morning, we're going to have a few minutes to come to the altar and to deal with this area in our lives because I believe if we will, we will see unity flourish in our lives like we never have before because God wants to set us free. So as, we, as, we, as I close, I'm going to close here in, in prayer and pray over you and then we're going to sing. And as we, when, I, when I finish praying here, here's what I want you to do. If you want to deal with an issue in your life that you need to walk in forgiveness in. Would you either come forward and just pray between you and God? Or if you want, you can come forward and pray with one of our prayer teams. We want to walk this out with you because I believe that it will bring freedom to your life. So Lord, we come before you this morning. God, this is the hard one. Jesus, this is hard. Because it just sits personal. It hurts. But we're, we're stuck. We're trapped when we stay in unforgiveness. So help us to Jesus to forgive this morning. Help us to walk out forgiveness. Let it start this morning just even confessing to you. I forgive this person. Help us to walk it out. Help us in our lives to wear the right clothes. Help us in our lives to forgive from a position of forgiveness. Help us in our lives to choose love. And help us in our lives to put peace in charge. Let us be a people of unity. That we would be a church that could declare, united we stand. And we will see the kingdom of God reign and rule in our lives, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our communities and in our nation. We love you, Lord, and we thank you that you have forgiven us. I do a work in our hearts this morning as we forgive. In Jesus' name.